Having a baby, isn't that an exciting time? When your kids do good at school, score a winning touchdown, uh, you catch that five-pound trout, that 12-point buck. You know, those are, there's times we have, we're excited about what we do. We don't get excited when the preacher talks about sex in church. It's just not something that we get excited about. I don't think most of us get excited about it. Um, especially when someone is, not, is someone is comfortable talking about sex. That even makes us bothered a little bit because it's not something we're just comfortable talking about. So I will make some of you comfortable this morning. See, I have a conviction that's been with me ever since the age of 12 that God is a part of everything in my life. And we, we need to see how God is involved in every aspect of our life. So we're having a family talk this morning. You know the dreaded talk. Most of us didn't have it with our kids because we weren't comfortable with it. But we're going to have a talk, and let's pray. Father, we... We thank you so much for your love, that we are such a marvelous creation, how anyone could ever doubt that there is a God I'll never understand, for our bodies are amazing. The way you've created and designed us, we know so little of what your thoughts are toward us. They are beyond measure, beyond number, and God, we are so precious to you. I pray this morning that your word would open up to us how you view us and how you want to view something that is so intimate and yet so corrupted by this world. God, would you open up our hearts to see your thoughts on this matter. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for that amen there. The word of the day is Hosanna. Can we all say Hosanna? Hosanna. And I hate to take Janice's illustration about the rocks to another level, but I will at the end of the sermon. And it's amazing how the Holy Spirit draws things together. The Ark of the Testimony, do we all know what the Ark is? Okay, there's a picture of the ark. This is the actual the cherubim, which were hammered gold. They were above the ark, and that is the, the mercy seat. It's pure gold. And it says in, in Exodus 25, 22, it says, There above the cover between the two cherubim that are over the ark of the testimony, I, God, I, God says, I will meet with you. And there at the mercy seat, that's where that atoning blood was offered once a year. And that is the place that if, when they were taken into captivity, Daniel prayed every day. He prayed to the east. He prayed to that mercy seat. He prayed to where it once was to seek mercy. And it's just like you and I, when we seek forgiveness of our sins, we pray to that mercy seat that Jesus Christ entered when he was upon that cross. And what is amazing about this mercy seat, that it became a symbol of God in the Old Testament, even in the New Testament. Some verses that you have in your notes. 1 Samuel 4, The Lord Almighty who is enthroned between the cherubim. And then hear us, O shepherd of Israel, you who sit enthroned between the cherubim. O Lord Almighty, God of Israel, enthroned between the cherubim. And even in Hebrews 9, Five, it says, above the ark were the cherubim of the glory. Now, most of us think that when we look at the, at the blood, that's how we look at God. But what God wants you to see is that when he, what he wants you to look at is his glory. The cherubim were the cherubim of glory. And what made it so glorious was there at the ark, we have the law, we have the blood, we have the, the, the condemnation because we disobeyed the law, 
We have the mercy. They've combined together. So here at this mercy seat between the cherubim, we have a picture of the glory of God because he has combined all this that he might be there. And that's significant. Anytime you look at the cross and you're mindful of your sins, you need to look and say, there's the glory of God. Don't let your sins distract you. Don't let your failures distract you. See that through the cross, we can come to the glory of God. On the veil, the veil that was torn in two was rent when, when Christ was crucified. There were the cherubim there. And when it was rent, the cherubim were torn in two. And what it meant was that no longer do we have to go to the mercy seat to go to God. We go to God directly through his blood. So we have communion with the glory of God, not based upon what we do or what a priest does, but based upon what Jesus has done for us. That's amazing. The communion is all about the glory of God. Now, we most of the time, you, you feel your holiness when you're by yourself. Did you know that? You have those moments of prayer by yourself. You, you occasionally have moments when you've seen the glory of God. I've, I've, but the thing about what God, that Jesus Christ opened up to us, is that he wants us to have the glory of God when we come together. Jesus said, where two or three or more of you are gathered in my name, I will be there. And he said, where two or th- when, if two or three agree on anything, and they ask the Father, it will be done for them. Jesus meant for Christianity to not be an individual thing, but to be a corporate, a group, two or more. That's where the power of Christ is at. Sadly, I can count on my hands uh, and under 10 times when I have felt I have seen the glory of God when I've been with another person or with a group. It's so rare. Most of the time when we come together in prayer, we're just doing it. But Jesus, when he, when he said this, there were two words that are important. Sinago means you must be gathered. It's a, it's a passive thing. Someone has brought you together. It's not because you're doing it because you, you, you just are going to do it. It's on my schedule. But something has happened to bring you together. And then the other, if you agreed, that's the word symphoneo, where we get that symphony, that the, the, all the instruments playing together in a chord, producing that beautiful harmony, or that whatever the note is, whatever it is, it's a beautiful agreeing together. Now we think that that's just a formula for prayer, that if someone prays something and I'm over here saying, I agree, oh yes, Lord, oh yes, then that, that, that happens. But no, it's God bringing you together, And your hearts are uniting in symphony because you both are being moved to want this. That's where the glory of God is. When people come together and they're in agreement. Now, most of the time when we're we're praying... Someone's praying, someone's thinking, oh man, I left the roast on too long, or I didn't get this ready. Or you think, well, we're very, very often not in agreement. Now, what does this have to do with sex? Well, let's see. You know, we have sex. Well, let me, let me read this little phrase that I wrote. The family that enjoys a deep, abiding presence of Jesus Christ is precisely because the husband and wife have invited Jesus into the deeper parts of their marriage. They are not coming together to pool their resources, save money, escape loneliness, are merely gain an outlet for sexual desires. They have joined their lives to deepen their faith in God. 
They see God in everything they do, even when it comes to your sexual relationship. Now, if you did not get married with that in mind, if you got married for all the normal reasons, it's never too late to bring God into your marriage. For you and your wife, you and your husband, to say, God, we want you in our marriage. We want you in our very deepest, most intimate part of our marriage. Now, sex is, from different perspectives, um, now, Jewish view, believe it or not, Jewish actually think that sexuality is a gift from God. Can you imagine that? Now, why would they think that? The reason is, is that God told the, the Jews to, you will be numbered beyond the, the, the sands of the earth. And that was the blessing from God is to have children. And so to have children, you have to have sex. And so they viewed that relationship as a gift from God. It was something that God said after he made Adam and Eve in, in Genesis 1.31. He, he said, it's all good. It's very good. And so Jewish people have this belief that sex is good. In fact, in the, in the Mishnah, which is the uh, writings that go along with the law, it's guaranteed for a woman. A Jewish wife are given three fundamental rights. Food, clothing, and the right of ona, which is sexual intercourse apart from the duty of procreation. It wasn't just for having kids. That was her right. Now, there was a Jewish rabbi, Nominides, who in the 13th century was disputing with some of the holier people. You know those holy people. And he wrote this. He said, through the act of intercourse, he used another word, they, became, they become partners with God in the act of creation. This is the mystery of what the sages said. When a man unites with his wife in holiness, the Shekinah is between them and the mystery of man and woman. The, 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 now that's an amazing statement. That when a couple, a married couple, comes together in sex, that God's Shekinah is there. He went on to write that we, the possessors of the Holy Torah, believe that God, may He be praised, created all of us as His wisdom decreed and did not create anything ugly or shameful. For if sexual intercourse was repulsive, then the reproductive organs are also rep repulsive. If the reproductive organs are repulsive, how did the Creator fashion something blemished? If that were so, we should find that His deeds were not perfect. Everything about the human body, God said, it is good. The Torah uses the word yada for sexual relations. It's the word to know. And that implies an intimate knowledge, an intimacy between a man and wife. And that is what God designed sex to be. It's a means of intimacy with each other. It's a gift from God. Now, there's a Christian view that some of us are aware of. And it kind of started when Paul was writing, and, and he said, well, it's really better if you can be celibate. You ever heard that word celibate? It's the reason that, that Roman Catholic priests are not normally married, unless they've come from another religion and they were married. They, the view that most Christians believe is that, that sex is something that gets in the way of your holiness with God. And that God, it's a, it's a, it's a fleshly act. It is something that is, it just gets in the way. I guess you can read my notes. Because the, the thing about the Christianity is that we have an emphasis upon the individual faith. It's, it's my faith with God, me and, and God, and that's what I need to work on. And if I get distracted with this sex thing, it gets in the way. That's the Christian view. Now, that, that view has, uh, when I was in Bible college, 
It was an unwritten, unwritten rule that husbands and wives should not have sex Saturday night because it gets in the way of their worship Sunday morning. I kid you not. In fact, the only time we could date was Friday night, Sunday afternoon. That was it. Now, it just, God made us sexual beings. Accept it. The problem with a lot of churches and Christianity is we, we tend to downplay that. We leave that alone. Well, you know, we emphasize the holiness aspect. The problem is that God's eyes are open when you're in your bedroom. God's eyes are open when you engage in sex. He doesn't close his eyes. Now, God's view, God made our bodies. He made them with amazing sensations. Now, the, the male reproductive organ is, can, has multiple uses, but God gave women one organ that is totally for sexual pleasure, the clitoris. It's, it's no, no other use than for sexual pleasure. So if God made it good, then sexual pleasure is good. I don't get a Hosanna on that one, do I? Okay. <laughs> Betty, Betty uh, Ricucci, who uh, wrote a book, I cited it somewhere. Within the context of covenant love and mutual service, intimacy should be exhilarating. And that's from Proverbs 5.19. Um, it's getting hot in here yet? Okay, good. All right. The thing that we've got to realize is that you don't separate sex from your spirituality. In fact, sex is a spiritual discipline all its own. Um, it, it's a discipline that can draw us into his presence. Um, God lives in earthen vessels. You and I are earthen vessels. That the glory might be of God and not of us. And it's my desire that we possibly can move past the negative connotations and the preconceptions of sex and examine how this experience can actually sharpen our spirituality. And it can be used to turn us toward our God and our spouse. God uses marriage and every aspect of it to make us holy like Jesus Christ. Now, God's Word teaches us three things about sex. First of all, sex is good by design, but there are things more important than sex. Okay, it's good, but there are things that are more important. Sex allows the, the experience of pleasure, but pleasure can never become the idol of our existence. Pleasure is there, but it's not to be an idol. And then sex seasons our lives, but will never fully nourish our souls. And so in order to uh, let sex become that spiritual discipline, there's three views that we need to, to change the way we think about. The first one is that we need to adopt a sacred view of sex in marriage. And there is a sacred view of sex. The, it, it's a mirror and it's a desire of our passion for God. You know, I don't know of anything in a marriage uh, that brings a couple together with that desire and that passion. You know, maybe a good steak now and then, but <laughs> sex, sex, it's got to be real good. But, but sex brings you together. That's, that's a picture of what God wants us to have towards him. Anything else other than, a, that, than coming together, anything else is... A corruption. It can be a corruption. Um, sex can be abused in a marriage relationship. Uh, if you read the front page of the star this morning, it, it can be abused 
in any other form. Um, it, it's a powerful force that can be helped, that can help us to grow spiritually, but it's also a powerful force that can corrupt and can destroy and can, can shame. Um, we, we need to see that there is a positive power of sex. And there are hurts, there are failures, there are things that, that, that you've watched, that you've read, that you've experienced, that, that can flavor your attitude towards sex. And it's very rare when a couple comes into a marriage that they don't bring the baggage from other relationships. And what I'm asking this morning is that we just redefine sex as the way God meant it to be when he created Adam and Eve. It's, it's something that he gave them. He said it's good. It's between a man and a woman who are united together for life. And kids, guys, young, young folk, um, I got married when I was 12, so I didn't have to, to go through what you're going through if you're waiting. It just, it was there, so I never had that struggle with sex and thoughts and desires, and that's a bunch of baloney. We struggle. But you, if you're going to develop this right view of sex, you've got to wait. You've got to wait. Now, what happens if you haven't? There's always the cross. Um, wives, let me give you a little advice on viewing this sacred view of sex and marriage. As Betty Ricucci wrote, in her Love That Last book, says, Believe it or not, we glorify God by cultivating a sexual desire for our husbands and by welcoming their sexual desire for us. That's the sacred view of sex, that it pictures your desire for God. And so you cultivate that, that welcoming. You know, you may, wives, you may desire your husband to be more godly. I don't know of a woman who doesn't have that desire. At least a Christian woman. But you've got to realize that God has given you the most powerful thing to encourage your husband to be godly. And that is this intimacy of sex. It would shock your husband to death. Is before, after, during, I don't care. You just said glory to God. Glory to God. God is here. Whoa. Wake him up. God is here. God is in this union. It shock him. Now husbands, I'm not going to place all the, the burden on the wise for this glory of God aspect. The real burden is upon you and upon me because the Bible says we need to learn to live with our wives. And, and, and that learning also involves the, involves the way Christ loved the church. And in that loving the church, he was willing to die for that church. And sometimes, men, we have to die to these desires that are just so hard to deal with. And, you, and in that dying, you learn to live with your wife. That's how you bring glory into your life. And I will say that sex is to be a shared spiritual experience. It's shared. It, in right context, involves two people, a man and a wife. It's shared. Now, we need to look at the sacred emotional view of sex and marriage. Um, we see that marriage is sacred, that God it, it uses it to, to mirror his, our relationship with him. It's a shared experience, but we've got to realize there is a sacred emotional view of marriage. And 
oftentimes you've got baggage, like I mentioned, that affects your emotions and your attitudes toward each other. And it gets in the way. It gets in the way of what God intends for that. I'm telling you, you can't watch television without some corruption of something that God designed. It's, it's, just, it's just, Peter wrote in 2 Peter 1.4, he says, By which have been given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that through these you might be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And if a marriage is to have God in it, in the most intimate parts of it, then we need to escape this corruption of lust that is in the world. We need to bring God's intimacy into our marriage. And the way that you do that is by claiming that precious promise. And the most important precious promise is thanking God in all things. When you thank God in all things, you bring God into that situation. No matter how hard, no matter how difficult, you bring God in there. And when God is in that situation, God can work amazing things. He promises that. And so in, our, in, our, in, our, in sexual relationships, in this uh, gratitude must replace guilt. It must replace any problems you have, any, any hang-ups you have. You've got to bring gratitude. Practice thanking God for what sex involves. I know you may think this is crazy, but wives, you can be thanking God that when your husband um, caresses you, that it entices you. You can thank God when your wife, because of the way she's tenderly treating you, that it, it excites you. God is there. You thank God for what is going on. Um, you, the other thing you can do is you can actually pray together before or after. It, it's, God is there. You bring God into this relationship. By gratitude. Getting hotter in here, isn't it? This simple act of thanksgiving sanctifies something that this world will tell you is dirty, is corrupt. It, you thank God. And the second thing you need to do is remove those roadblocks that will hinder you from seeing sex as God designed it. It, it's honorable before God. This relationship with this woman that you've married, it's, it's honorable. And if you have a history of sexual abuse, if you have a, pro, a, a history of things that, that are really causing some problems, you do need counseling. There are things you need to work through. But the best way to start working through it is to have gratitude in your sexual relationships. Here's the, here's the thing. If, if we don't thank God for sex and for pleasure, we're insulting him. Because he said, be thankful in all things. I have made this. It's my gift to you. Thank me for it. Now, if the pain of a fast, if you've ever fasted, it hurts. Especially you go three, four, five days. It, it hurts. It's tough. If that can draw you closer to God, why can't the pleasure of a gift that he's given you be used to draw you to God too. We, we need to correct the way we view sex, that sacred theology of sex. We need to correct the way we have our emotional view and attachment towards sex. But then we also need to have a, a new definition of this intimacy that we seek in the sexual relationships. And that is that sacred view of your spouse. Now this may seem corny or weird to some of you, but your you're married to your spouse, but she is still your Christian brother or sister. And beyond this, this marriage relationship that will last 30, 40, 50 years, you've got an eternal relationship with her that will continue way past eternity where you will not be married. And what is going to count 
for eternity. Will it be that momentary sexual satisfaction? No. It will, build, it will be that fellowship, that eternal glory of God that you've brought into your marriage. And so you view your spouse as your brother or your sister. And you see this as a means of them growing towards God. Sex cannot be seen as just a physical experience. I watched the uh, session Andy Stanley taught on, from his Twisted Truth series. And he said that the, the greatest lie that, that Satan has is to reduce sex to just an act or just an experience, a physical thing. But sex in itself, between a man and a woman who are married together, God designed to be the greatest means of intimacy ever. And when you reduce it to this act that you just do to get it out of the way, or whatever your view is of it, you, you, you rob that intimacy from your life. And when you engage in it, when you're, when you're single, um, or, or outside of marriage, or in a wrong way, any type of illicit behavior, it steals that ability to be intimate in your marriage when that happens. Now, we've got to realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. I didn't say your heart. I didn't say your spirit. I said your body. That's in 1 Corinthians 6, 19. It says, or do you not know that your body is, the temp is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. Did you hear that? You're not your own. So glorify God in your body. When a husband and a wife come together, you're coming together as sanctified, holy bodies. God is present. God is present. You know, this from the same verse, Paul was using this to show why you should not engage in illicit sex with a prostitute or in another manner because God is present. Well, if you can use that same illustration as to why you don't have sex, illicit sex, you can use that same illustration to show why you do have sex and that is to bring God and His holiness into your marriage. Your bodies belong to God. It, it's, that's what He said. And so if they belong to him, everything that he gives you within his proper way of doing it is glory to him. God's temple means God's presence. It is not sacrilege. Some of you are thinking this is sacrilege to think about this, but it is not sacrilege to say that God is present in your bedroom and God is present when you're engaging in sex. His Shekinah glory is there. Otto Piper wrote, we have come together in God, called by Him, creating a family, serving Him, and we are now expressing physically the spiritual truth that He has created. We are no longer two, but one. Now, this, this spiritual component of sex, of this fleshly act, if you do not have this spiritual component, you open yourself up to corruption, but when you put this spiritual aspect into this sexual um, experience, it will deliver you from sexual perversions. It will deliver you from a sexual um, hang-ups. If we reduce sex to pleasure alone, to that physical act, there is no wife in here that could ever meet her husband's expectations. There is no man that could ever meet a wife's expectations. Uh, pleasure is always fleeting. It, it, uh, pleasure, if that is your focus, then it will always be something you're ever looking for. And that look may take you into pornography. It may, may take you into doing this or whatever. You, if you don't have a spiritual meaning of this intimate act, then it can open you up to all that. 
Um, some, some, some men like to get their wives reinvented. They, they pay for plastic surgery or this or that. It's never enough. Because that pleasure focus will always leave you empty. It's only when you see that this thing that can be so physical can also be so spiritual because God is there. Now, every hunger that entices us in the flesh is an exploitation that can be better met by God. Godly sex is married sex. That's it. Anything else, anything else outside of marriage is illicit, it's degrading, it's wrong, it's destructive, and it will always be with you. Only if you go through the cross will you find deliverance. Sex must be seen as both a physical and a spiritual experience. Can I ask something question, crazy? Is there, is there anyone who's ever thought that sex is a spiritual experience? Couple, three, good, good. Now we're going to think about it all the time, aren't we? Those of you that are married. Gary Thomas, let me read what he wrote. To embrace fully marital sexuality and all that God designed it for, couples must bring their Christianity into bed and break down the wall between their physical and spiritual intimacy. Sex is about physical touch, to be sure, but it's about far more than physical touch. It's about what's going on inside us. Developing a fulfilling sex life means I concern myself more with bringing generosity and service to bed than with bringing a washboard abdomen. I, it means I see my wife as a holy temple of God, not just as a tantalizing human body. It even means that sex becomes a form of physical prayer. A picture of heavenly intimacy that rivals the Shekinah glory of old. Now, let me give you some practical advice to deal with this power of sex. Now, sex is not a physical drive. Now, you may say, no, I know that's a physical drive. But no, it's not. You can go an entire lifetime without an orgasm, and you can still live. Sex is a physiological drive. It's, it's, predictable, it's predictable, it is physical, it's emotional, but it's physiological. It's, that, it's not a physical drive. So if it's physiological, then it's there by design. God made it a part of the way we think. And the reason that is, is that it's a means of drawing couples together that normally are selfish and and. In our, own, in our own thinking, we, we want to be a part. It, it's something physiological. A man that's married to a woman, he will desire her. It's physiological. And that is the way God designed it, to bring them together. Because we're by nature very selfish. We tend to, we tend to uh, be in our own world. And this is one means that God brings us together. Why not make it something that pleases Him? So what you do is you place your sex drive under the lordship of the Holy Spirit. You ever done that? Say, God, I give this to you. Would you, Holy Spirit, be the Lord of my sex drive? We don't focus on the spouse that we, have, that we want. We focus on the spouse we have. God, this is my wife. This is whom you've given me. I thank you. I praise you. Now, would you bring our relationship under the lordship of the Holy Spirit? Value the things that God values. In wives, there's an inner adorning that is far more beautiful. When the lights are out, that inner adorning, a man will appreciate so much more when the lights are out. That inward gratitude, that inner feeling toward him of appreciation, of respect, that inner adorning, Peter says, is far more precious than the outward thing you could do. But you've also got to accept the inevitably there will be changes in desires, changes in appearances, changes in weight, changes in everything that goes on. And what better way to keep something 
so physical, so alive throughout all your married life than to make it a spiritual experience. The character of time will flavor your sexual relationships when it's brought under the lordship of the Holy Spirit. And an exhortation to give what you have. Don't try to pretend. Don't try to be something you're not. But give what you have. Jesus admired the widow who gave the last mite because she gave what she had. And a husband and wife, you come together, you give what you have. And you rejoice in it. You accept those imperfections. We also need, we need to accept that this sexual physiological drive, God designed to make us connect with each other. It, we've got testosterone. We've got hormones. We've got these things that God put into our bodies that do rear their heads now and then. And they will drive us to connect. Now, the one thing that's amazing about this is that sometimes, husbands, you're better off to hold your tongue if you want to enjoy your wife that night. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes you have to swallow your pride. Sometimes you have to do this or that. And God designed that to get you to connect. It's his way of keeping you falling toward each other. Our sex drive literally calls us into each other. Now, we need to realize, practical thing is that we need passion in our relationship. If you look at the, the major characters in the Bible, Moses, Abraham, David, Solomon, they all had a passion for God. They had a heart desire for Him. They failed, but they had a passion for God. And wives and husbands, this passion that is in this physical act will transfer over to your spiritual passion for God if you bring God into that relationship. And wives, if you want your husband to be passionate in life, sometimes you've got to realize there's some things that he values. And I can value that spiritual growth through that. Husbands, you've got to realize that your wife values certain things. And when you share that value, the passion will be there. You want passion in your relationship, then you've got to fall towards each other and realize that this, this sexual act that the world says is just an act is actually something that will give you passion in your relationship. It will give you passion with your children, passion in every aspect of your life. Now, you don't always think spiritual thoughts when you're engaging in sex. Sometimes there may be spiritual thoughts. Um, sometimes it's just physical. But if it's between a man and a woman married, it's honorable before God. Life is to be a celebration. I would hate to go through life without celebrating a few times, wouldn't you? Amen. I want celebration. We're going to have some good food in just a minute. I want to celebrate. Now, when Jesus came into the city, in Matthew 2, 21, 9, it says, the people gathered around him all up and down the street, and they said, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Quoting from Psalm 118, Hosanna in the highest. And then Luke puts this contrast in it. When the Pharisees heard this going on, they, they looked at Jesus and said, get your disciples to shut up. This doesn't belong. And Jesus said, if my disciples did not shout out the very stones of this way, the very stones all around us would start shouting out. Now, he said there was a phrase that they were using. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And Jesus said later on in Matthew 23, when he was, he was looking over the people there, he was overlooking the city, and he was weeping. 
And he was saying, how often would I as a mother hen gather you together to bring you to me? And he said, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now Jesus Christ is overlooking your marriage. And he wants to be intimately involved in every aspect of your relationship. He wants to draw you into himself. He wants you to say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. You're brought together. You're brought together through him. And when you come together in in your communion, in, in anything you do, when you eat, when you have sexual relations, when you come together, you come together in the name of the Lord. That is how you will see Jesus Christ. That is how you will see the glory of God every day in your relationship. And he says, if you don't praise me, if you don't, the, ro- the rocks will cry out. I believe someday we'll see rocks praising God. Now you all sometimes put candles by the bed, candles by the bath. You set that romantic stage. I think you should set some rocks out. Put those rocks right there on the, on the dresser. Put them on the wall. And when you see that rock, you say, if I don't bring Christ into my bedroom, someday I'll see that rock cry out. But for me, I'm going to be crying out, praise you, praise you God. This is a gift from you that you designed to draw us together into you. We need to bring the glory of God into our bedrooms. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this difficult subject. That, Father, we will look back when we're in heaven and say, boy, I missed out on so much because I never saw how sanctified it was to you. And, Lord, I just pray that you would enable each and every married couple here to bring you into their bedroom. And, Father, to see that this is a means of seeing your glory.